creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. We're going to take up where we left off last week. Last week we were talking about Noah's Ark and how dinosaurs had to be on the ark. So now we're going to cover the question, what happened to the dinosaurs when they got off the ark? The question of what happened to the dinosaurs has been a source of uh, discussion among groups of people for ever since dinosaurs were discovered. As far as anybody can figure out, the first one, at least in modern times, that was found and reassembled was in 19, uh, 1809. A dentist, or a doctor, I'm sorry, was uh, going, back in those days, doctors made house calls, you know, and they didn't drive Mercedes. But um, not, not that that's good or bad, it's just the fact. And so this uh, doctor was out at a house call, and his wife is standing out there at the carriage waiting for her husband to come out when he's done with taking care of his patient. Well, meanwhile, some guys are fixing a, a drain culvert across. Now, you got to understand, in the 1800s, there wasn't a lot of heavy construction being done. I mean, nobody was digging huge canals. Nobody was digging giant holes, because whatever you did in the dirt, you did with a shovel and a pick. You know, there weren't any giant machines to do this. So there was very little earth moving going on during the early 1800s. And so when they were digging this little uh, trench to put the uh, uh, drain pipe in or something, fixing some field tile, they, this, these workers discovered some bones, strange bones, especially the big teeth. And so when this doctor came out, uh, the, the wife had been talking to these workers and said, what are these? They said, no, we don't know. We found these here digging in the ditch. And so they, um, they gave them to her, and she showed them to her husband, and he said, he was a doc medical doctor, an intelligent man, and he said, yeah, these, look like, these look exactly like the teeth from an iguana, only they're huge. And so they dug around for more and found most of the bones and actually put it together. Now, they put it together wrong, uh, made many mistakes as they reassembled it. If I handed you a pile of bones and said, here, tell me what this is. <laughs> There's no telling what you come up with unless you were really good with anatomy. Uh, so anyway, they put it together. <laughs> they did a pretty good job, but they blew it. And uh, they named it Iguanodon. The word don means teeth, like an orthodontist, okay? Um, they, because it had iguana-shaped teeth. So Iguanodon was actually the first dinosaur in modern times that was reassembled from the bones. Since then, they have found many Iguanodons and put them together and found all the mistakes that they made. For instance, on the original Iguanodon, they found this round, uh, sort of like a snow cone cup, you know, pointed at one end and round at the other end. And um, they said, wow, it was hard. And they said, it sharp. They said, it must be a horn on his nose. So they put it on his nose. Later, they found out it was actually his thumb. They'd only found one of them. So, you know, one of the many mistakes that were made with the Iguanodon. The point is, it was 1809 when they found these, uh, the first one and reassembled it. For the next 40 years, many dinosaurs were found, and it really became quite a competition among different groups to go out and find these giant creatures. This is 1809. Now, several things are happening in the early 1800s. People are starting to believe the Earth is millions of years old because of the works of some uh, other scientists. Uh, and then you get to 1830, you come to Charles Lyell, who said, who developed our geologic column. So the early 1800s is really where the world lost its uh, biblical basis, and they sacrificed it and accepted evolution teaching, the early stages of evolution. So here they're finding these giant animals, these giant lizards, that nobody has any idea where they fit into history. At the same time, you've got a bunch of people going around teaching a, a false doctrine called the fixidity of the species. They're teaching, well, if there's 14 kinds of finches, then God created 14 kinds of finches, because nothing ever changes. And see, they got off track of what the Bible says. The Bible says the animals will bring forth after their kind, and they went beyond the Word of God and said, no, it's only, you know, God made every different species, which is not at all what the Bible says. So here you have a false doctrine being taught by the Christians, uh, a false doctrine being taught by the scientists. They're teaching the earth is millions of years old, and people are starting to believe this. So now in come the dinosaurs. They start finding these giant lizards. It's pretty obvious from the bones that they're finding that they're reptiles and that they're huge. By 1841, they made up a brand new word, dinosaur. Richard Owen made up the word. That'll be a quiz question. You know who invented the word dinosaur and when was it invented? It was 1841. Sir Richard Owen was a very famous scientist in Europe and everybody respected his opinion. And he said, these are giant lizards. And he took a two words, Latin and Greek, and mixed them together. Dinosaur is from two different languages. And so our English word uh, come, comes from that, dinosaur. Well, right away, people began to guess and speculate, what are these creatures? When did they live? 
So here you have an ideal time for Satan to come in and start teaching a false idea. Satan, of course, sees all this happening and says, wow, here's my chance to use these creatures, these dinosaurs, to turn people away from God. He knows, of course, the earth is about 6,000 years old, and God certainly knows that, and the Bible certainly teaches that, and everybody believed that in the early 1800s. But now in come the dinosaurs. And so they began arguing about the question, what happened to the dinosaurs? <clears throat> Why did these creatures die? Some people were teaching, well, they drowned in the flood. And uh, may, some people started teaching maybe they were wicked and, you know, Noah wouldn't allow them on the ark. Now, that would be uh, a false teaching. You know, two of everything went onto the ark. And so it was really a time of turmoil when they didn't quite have enough information to know where they fit into history. They were just kind of recently discovered. The false things were being taught. And so some Christians started accepting and teaching the idea that these dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. And so we, we lost the battle in 18, 1840. The battle was lost. People were pretty well convinced. The majority of the population was convinced the earth is millions of years old. And that leaves room for Charles Darwin to come in later and say, well, hey, if the earth is millions of years old, that's, uh, that's time for a lot of changes. And so people readily accepted the evolution idea because they'd already compromised their Bible in some other areas. So what happened to the dinosaurs is a question that kids face all the time in public schools. The textbooks will give the kids some options to choose from. Like, uh, did a meteor strike the Yucatan Peninsula and make the dinosaurs go extinct? That's the most commonly taught theory. If you look at the map of Mexico, at the bottom, around the Gulf of Mexico, it curves back up. It's got that little bump sticking up. That's called the Yucatan Peninsula. It's really not too far from Cuba, where Mexico curls down and comes back up. Uh, Right there on the Yucatan Peninsula, they find evidence of a giant meteor strike. Something hit the ground there, a huge meteor hit the ground. And so they threw up some, uh, they say it threw up some iridium, which is a rare element found generally in meteors, and they find this stuff in the drillings in the coast of, uh, off the coast of Florida. So they say, see, this is proof of the meteor strike. Without getting into all the meteor strike arguments, the fact is the Earth is not millions of years old. A meteor probably struck the Earth. That happens all the time. But it doesn't mean it was 65 million years ago. But they will give the kids options. Did the dinosaurs go extinct because of a meteor strike? Or did the mammals start becoming more popular and start eating all the eggs of the dinosaurs and they couldn't survive? You know, but basically, the question is always, what happened to the dinosaurs? Why did they go extinct? Like this textbook says, dinosaurs lived on the earth for millions of years. Now only their fossils are left. What do you think happened to the dinosaurs? Dinosaurs are extinct. An extinct animal is an animal that no longer lives on earth. So the questions, what made them go extinct, I say, is the wrong question. The liberals are really good at getting us to argue about the wrong topic. They ask me all the time, do you think we should have prayer in public schools? You know, should we teach the Bible in public schools? You know, et cetera, et cetera. I say, look, that's a good question, and I'll be glad to talk about it. But there's another question we need to ask first. The real question is, should we have public schools? I mean, that's the real question. If you read uh, your Constitution in the Tenth Amendment, Article 10, also called the Tenth Amendment, says, The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are preserved to the states respectively or to the people. What this says is, if this document doesn't spell out, that, if it doesn't say you can do this, then you can't. This was the closing argument to say, whatever you think you have power to do, if it's not spelled out in here, you don't have power to do it. So, no place in the Constitution does it give the federal government the authority to have an education system. The federal government should not be involved in education. They should not be involved in welfare. They shouldn't be involved in an awful lot of things they're involved in. For instance, uh, one of the uh, great statesmen, I believe it was Davy Crockett, I read the story. Uh, Jan, you do a lot of literature. Maybe you can find that for me. Where Davy Crockett uh, was in Congress or in the Senate, I forget which he was in, but um, they had a fire and a whole section of the city burned. I think it was Washington, D.C. or one of the suburbs there in Virginia. Massive catastrophe, you know. Back in those days, the houses were built, no fire code, and <laughs> very poor construction, a lot of them, and built real close together. So this fire started, <laughs> burned the whole city. A lot of people are suffering, no house, you know, no food, no job, etc. Congress voted to take federal funding and come in and rescue these people and give them government aid. Davy Crockett voted for that. And I believe it was Davy Crockett. I may have my name wrong, but it's one of those people like that. Um, later that year, 
Davy Crockett was out stumping, trying to get people to vote for him because the election was coming up. Here's this old farmer out there plowing the field with his mule, you know, and Davy Crockett stopped and looked, leaned over the fence, and the farmer finally stopped his mule and came over and said, uh, Sir, I'm Mr. Crockett, and I'm in Congress. I'd like you to vote for me to re-election. farmer said, Nope, can't do it. Can't vote for you again, ever. He said, I voted for you last time. I thought you were a good man, but I can't vote for you. He said, Well, well why not? He said, because uh, you voted to give those folks uh, federal money for rebuilding their houses. He said, well, man, there was a whole city burned and they were all suffering. And the farmer said, well, you only did that because you live near these folks and you know about them. What about the people in, uh, you know, 500 miles away that are having, there's catastrophes all the time. Mr. Crockett, you have violated my trust because that money was not your money to spend. That money was my money and everybody else's money delegated to you to spend according to the Constitution. And he gave Davy Crockett a lesson on the Tenth Amendment that the federal government has no business being involved in welfare. This man said, if that city burned and those people were needing some money, every one of you congressmen should have reached in your pocket and taken your money out and given it to them. You have no authority to spend that money, that federal money, on your pet projects because you think it's important. And Davy Crockett said, Sir, I am sorry, I promise I will never do that again. And he talked to the farmer for a while, and finally the farmer said, Okay, well, I'll, everybody makes a mistake once. I'll let it go this time. But rest assured, if you do this, something like this again, I will not only not vote for you, I will campaign against you. And if we had a bunch of folks that were that smart in our country that realized our government is spending money on things they have no business spending money on. Now, when you mention this, that we shouldn't even have a public school system, People will come back and say, well, don't you think kids need an education? Oh, that's not the question. Of course kids need an education. Of course kids need to learn. Of course we need to have schools. But should the government be involved is the question. And if they don't like what the Constitution says, they should lobby to change the Constitution. They shouldn't just ignore it and go around it. So, back to the dinosaurs. What happened to them? Well, before we get there, you might want to find out this article on why the schools went public. I would recommend you get on the website, exodus2000.org. Uh, Ray, Ray Moore Jr. is a friend of mine, just has a tremendous, tremendous information on what's happening in our schools and how that it's really part of a larger plan toward a new world order. Exodus2000.org. Eagle Forum also has a good website, eagleforum.org, uh, I believe, or .com. That's Phyllis Schlafly's organization in Alton, Illinois, by St. Louis. So that'd be some good information if you want to go off and chase that rabbit tail. You can get also, also get uh, Blumenfeld's, uh, uh, Samuel Blumenfeld has great, great information on this topic, as does Reasons Foundation. They're just Many people, this, this is a topic I love to read about. I don't have time to chase that rabbit too far down the hole. But the public schools are part of a long-range plan. It's actually Karl Marx's idea, free public education. That's a vital step in the advancement of communism. And we'll get into that much later on uh, Seminar Part 5. Okay, what happened to the dinosaurs? Before the flood, we have a world where people are living 900 years. Beautiful climate, canopy of water probably overhead, increasing air pressure, no, gen no genetic load or very little genetic deformities because, you know, the race is still pure and no, nothing has entered in that would cause those things. Now we have a flood that destroys all that. So after the flood, we notice a very different world. The time before the flood... People are living 900 years. After the flood, it drops off to 400 right away. Noah's son, Shem, only lived to be 600 years old, which is really pretty incredible when you consider the average age is 912 before the flood. His life is one-third shorter than the average of everybody those came before him. That's like if the average age today is uh, 70 and somebody only lives to be... Um, Oh, one third of that be uh, 45 or so. We'd say, boy, he died young, didn't he? Everybody thought, wow, Shem died awful young. Of course, Noah didn't live to see that. And then Shem's son, Arphaxad, only lived to be 438 years. Actually, Shem outlived Arphaxad. I've wondered about that. You know, why did Shem live longer than his sons and his great grandson and almost longer than his great grandson? Well, possibly Shem, during his formative years, the first hundred years of his life, he was in the pre-flood environment. So he would have had a very different uh, uh, stamina. Yeah, his physical abilities were probably much greater. 
because just like if a, if a child is, is raised in a, a poor environment and have poor nutrition, uh, they're likely to be stunted for life, mentally or physically or both. If you don't give a kid, even during the prenatal, before they're born, if a mother does things, you know, smokes or drinks or whatever, just deprives the child of oxygen, it can affect that kid for the rest of his life. Yeah, short, right? Vietnam, poor food, or minimum, not enough food. Okay, average height in America now is much higher than it was, you know, 100 years ago. We're getting it's easier to get food, more steroids and pesticides, or no, you know, steroids in the beef and stuff we eat, so causing all sorts of trouble. Anyway, lifespan dropped off to 400 years for a few generations. Then it dropped off to 200. Now there's probably a, a couple of reasons why it dropped off again in the days of Peleg. Uh, we get into that, the days of Peleg, we'll get into that later um, in video number six, so seminar part six. It'll probably be four years till we get there in our class at the rate we're going. But why did it drop off again? But then after a couple generations of 200 years old, you come to a fellow named, uh, to Abraham's father, actually, Terah, who lived to be 205. Then it dropped below 200. Abraham was 175. And when you read that, that sounds really old. But if you look at his ancestors, that's nothing. Just about everybody's living longer than that. So it keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. It got down to probably 70 or 80 years average lifespan for quite a while. There were people in Bible times that lived to be over 100. There were people in Bible times that were 6 foot 6. You know, Abe Lincoln was 6 foot 6. But the average height of the people during, you know, 100 years ago was shorter. There were still people that were 8 feet tall, you know. Um, so things are dropping off. During the Dark Ages, it really dropped off when we had, you know, knowledge suppressed by the Catholic Church, you know. And so there's about a thousand year span in here where information is suppressed in order to keep people dumb and keep people enslaved to, you know, the church dogma. Then in the last 500 years, we've seen an Im improvement in a lot of medical fields and things like that, diet diets and sanitation. A lot of sanitary laws. I think. And we've got a videotape called The Bible and Health that'll give you a ton of information on, you know, God's plan for what the scripture says about health. Sanitary laws, dietary laws, etc., etc. Okay. So the same thing that happened to the people, their lifespans are being shortened after the flood. That's also happening to the animals. Reptiles that lived before the flood and got to be 80 feet long now simply can't live as long. And therefore, they can't grow as big. And therefore, some of them even might die before they reach maturity to have kids of their own. And so the whole species goes extinct. You mentioned about the uh, panthers and stuff probably going to go extinct, you know, if the, or the cougars or even the uh, um, cheetahs. Just, there just aren't enough of them. You know, the gene pool is too limited and they're probably, the panda bear is probably going to go extinct. It's just, uh, it's probably a genetic uh, deformity or a mutation from the original bear and they're pretty and they're cute, but they're just not going to make it, okay? If you left the chihuahuas in, in the world all alone, leave them all alone, put them out in the woods, <laughs> they wouldn't make it. They just, it's a, it's a useless dog, in my opinion. Okay, uh, so here we have a time after the flood when lifespans are dropping off, and so people are killing the dinosaurs. In addition to them dying from the climate, they've also got people going against them. I think they killed them for several reasons. They killed them for meat. There would be a lot of hamburger in one brachiosaurus. They killed them because they were a menace. You know, nobody wants to live next door to a dinosaur. They killed him to be a hero. I saved the village, you know, I slew the dragon. They killed him to prove his superiority or competition for land or medicine, med med medicinal purposes. All kinds of ancient recipes call for dragon bones or dragon saliva or dragon fat. I mean, here you're reading this, what would appear to be a normal recipe. You know, you mix this and this and this and, you know, a little bit of dragon fat and... It's not like they're trying to exaggerate. It's just like, hey, it's just normal. You're supposed to put that in there. You know, everybody does. You know, don't you know? <laughs> kind of stuff. So, especially if somebody gets the idea that, you know, if you, uh, if you mix dragon bones in your soup, it'll do something special for you, you know. Then people are going to go out and hunt the dragons just to kill them for their, their body parts. Just like the rhinoceros. You know, the poor rhinoceros has this, you know, like a fingernail uh, horn on his nose that's made of the same material, keratin. Some guys in some of these countries get the, get the dumb idea that, you know, if you make a knife and the handle is made out of a rhinoceros horn, you will be invincible. Nobody will be able to beat you in battle. Well, of course, we know that's not true, but it is kind of hard on the rhinoceros. 
And so that's probably what happened to the dragons. People were killing them off for all sorts of reasons. The Bible mentions dragons quite a few times. Uh, 35 times, actually, dragons are mentioned in the Bible. That'd be a good quiz question. How many times are dragons mentioned in the Bible? You have to understand the King James Version would not mention dinosaurs. Who can tell me why the King James Version would not mention dinosaurs? The name dinosaur hadn't been invented yet. King James Version translated in 1611, the word dinosaur made up in 1841. Obviously, they're not going to use a word that hasn't been invented yet. So they used the word dragons, which was used all through history. They're called dragons. And there are many books written about this, and literally thousands of legends of people talking about seeing dragons, or killing dragons, or somebody being killed by a dragon. The word dinosaur made up in 1841 by Richard Owen. Up until that time, they're known as dragons. Now, after the flood, you got eight people. Everybody, you know, spreads out around the world in the next few hundred years. They have kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, and pretty soon you start to get a good-sized population. And they're spreading out, taking over new territory, you know, civilizing the world. <clears throat> However, <laughs> whatever you think of that, that's what they did. As they spread out, the population begins to grow. Big, ferocious animals are going to be killed off. How many grizzly bears here in Escambia County, Pensacola, Florida, roam in the woods? None. Right. How many were there 500 years ago, you think? Probably lots of them. Well, what happened? When the more people move into an area, the more the big ferocious animals just aren't welcome. They're going to be driven off or they're going to be killed off. If it came on the evening news tonight that there were five grizzly bears roaming around Pensacola, Florida, what would happen by 6 in the morning? Every redneck in the country would be out there with his rifle trying to shoot one, right? And whoever could shoot the biggest one would have his picture in the paper the next morning holding it up by the tail, you know, I shot the grizzly bear and saved the village. Right? Now, nothing has changed. Okay? People are still the same. They were looking to kill these dragons for all these reasons, because they were a menace um, to be a hero. If you, uh, you, you go deer hunting at all? I ask the deer hunters, you know, those poor guys go out and try to shoot Mabby's daddy all the time. Um, I say, if you're up in your tree stand and five bucks come running through the woods, you only have time to get off one shot. <clears throat> Which one are you going to shoot at? The largest one, the biggest one, okay? Well, if you have this same mentality back 4,000 years ago and there's dragons out there to hunt, which one are you going to go for? The biggest one. Actually, they find now with satellite images, it's pretty interesting. I need to get a slide of this. There are, you know what a key, keyhole looks like? The old-fashioned keyhole, it's round on top, and then two V's coming down like this. The old-fashioned skeleton key would go in the keyhole. A uh, round circle with a triangle at the bottom. From satellites, they've noticed all over Europe and America, it, it appears to be thousands of years old, where somebody had built a giant keyhole shape like a funnel that would, you could herd all, chase a bunch of animals, they'd hit this funnel and they'd end up in this, in this circle, a corral. You, uh, you chase them into this keyhole, bottom part of the keyhole, and they end up going in the circle. Only these things are two miles long, these keyholes. You can't even see them tear up in a satellite, you know, and you see the, they're picking these things out. A lot of research been done uh, by this, on this topic by uh, William Corliss at uh, the Source Book Project, it's called. Fascinating stuff he has. Um, Show, show some of the pictures and drawings of these things. The theory is that people were using these to chase, you know, when they want to civilize an area to take over a new area for, you know, build your city, they go in there and they chase all the dragons or whatever into this area using torches or, you know, something that makes noise or fly, flames or something. And they end up trapped in here and then you slaughter them because you surround them. You pen them in. Now they're easier to hunt, like shooting fish in a barrel. So, I think after the flood, people are killing these dragons. And there are literally thousands of legends of people killing dragons. If you want to read some amazing stories, I'd recommend you read, like, for instance, the Gilgamesh epic about Gilgamesh who slew a dragon. We have a book that we offer here called The Great Dinosaur Mystery uh, by Paul Taylor. Let's see, we're in our office now. The book is here someplace. But a great book talking about dragons all through history. There's a Chinese legend. Um, oh, you were in China for a while, Jan? Chinese legend says a famous uh, man named Yu, after the great flood, Yu surveyed the land of China and divided it into sections. He built channels to drain the water off into the sea and make the land livable again. 
Many snakes and dragons were driven from the marshlands. You're reading this Chinese story, and it's, uh, you know, we've got to build the channels to get rid of the water. We, you know, it's all swampy. We've got to, you know, drain the land so we can build our cities. By the way, we had to drive out the dragons. And, you know, just like it's normal. Everybody has to do that, you know. Nobody thought anything about it. This is from uh, Wycliffe, Bible, Wycliffe Bible Encyclopedia. This is the god Marduk. Now, the Babylonians had all sorts of gods. One of their gods was Marduk. Here's Marduk shown pictured sitting on top of a fire-breathing dragon. Notice the flame coming out of his mouth. Fire-breathing dragon. Now, there's lots of legends about dragons, but there are also an awful lot of legends about fire-breathing dragons. So where would this fit in? In the book of Isaiah, it talks about a fiery flying serpent. Hmm. In the book of Job, it talks about... Uh, in Job chapter 41, it's got an entire chapter about an animal called Leviathan. And it says, Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. You might want to watch our videotape, the green one over there with the L on it, about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. There really was a fire-breathing dragon. Um, in Job 41, it says this, about this Leviathan, Out of his nostrils go a smoke. I've seen deacons do that at Southern Baptist churches between Sunday school and church. Uh, it says, Out of a seething potter cauldron, his breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. The Bible certainly teaches there was a fire-breathing dragon. There's certainly a lot of history about fire-breathing dragons. It is chemically possible to do that. Uh, and we've got an animal today called bombardier beetle that does a similar thing. It sprays out two chemicals and burns his enemies. They're here in Florida. They call them the blister bug, the bombardier beetle. We cover all that on video about Leviathan. Anyway, if you get a Catholic Bible, the Catholic Bible has seven extra books, and a few of the books have extra chapters. For instance, the book of Daniel in our Bible has 12 chapters. In the book of Daniel in the Catholic Bible, it has 14 chapters. One is about Susan, or Susanna, uh, and chapter 13 is, and then chapter 14 is about the dragon. This chapter is known as Bell and the Dragon. Fascinating reading. Okay, I don't think it should be part of Scripture. But here's where the story goes. Catholic Bible, Daniel 14, 22. And there was a great dragon in the place, and the Babylonians worshipped him. And the king said to Daniel, Behold, thou canst not say now that this is not a living God. Adore him, therefore. And Daniel said, I adore the Lord my God, for he is the living God, but that is no living God. But give me leave, O king. That's an old English phrase that means you give me permission. I will kill this dragon without sword or club. And the king said, I give thee leave. In other words, I'd like to see how you're going to do this. How, are you, how would you kill this dragon without a sword or a club? Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and boiled them together and made lumps and put them into the dragon's mouth, and the dragon burst asunder. Very strange story. Here's the Hoven translation of what's going on. The Bible tells us in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, that Daniel was one of those who was skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science. Well, I would assume that Daniel probably knew that nearly all animals like things that taste salty. You put a salt block out in the woods and the deer come up, the cows come up, everything comes to lick the salt. Daniel took pitch and fat and hair. Well, pitch is sticky, made from tree sap. You take pine tree sap and boil it down and make pitch. There were whole industries used to make pitch just to cover the ships back 200 years ago before they discovered oil. First really commercial oil well was in Pennsylvania, Becky, in 1828, I believe. Uh, so before that time, they, had, they still had to make their ships waterproof, and they would use pitch, where they boil down the sap of these trees. Daniel took pitch, which is sticky, and fat, which tastes salty, and hair, which won't digest. You ever see a cat or a dog cough up when they get a hairball? You know, <laughs> cough up this hairball. Um, Hair won't digest. So Daniel took these three, boiled them together, made lumps, gave them to the dragon, and the dragon burst asunder. Hoven translation is, Daniel tossed these things in the cage. The dragon ate them up because they tasted good. They wouldn't digest because of the hair. They stuck in his intestinal tract. And this was the ultimate case of, case of uh, dragon constipation. And the dragon burst asunder. Those were the days before Roto-Rooter. And so <laughs> it blew him up. What a way to go, huh? But it's just an interesting story in the Catholic Bible about uh, dragon. 
Yeah, they blow up. You feed them too much, they founder, right? Yeah. Saddam is saying, uh, Hussein, um, Saddam thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. The guy has a serious ego problem. He has huge pictures of himself all over the countryside. He has his picture in front of Nebuchadnezzar on their currency. He claims that he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. Now his name is Saddam Hussein. Saddam means, or Saddam means prince. George Bush always called him Saddam Hussein. You go back and listen to the news reels, you know, George Bush always called him Saddam Hussein. Oh, this was done very intentionally. It wasn't that George Bush is stupid and didn't know, you know how to pronounce his name. The word Saddam is the Arabic word that means horse's rear end. So George Bush was intentionally, intentionally calling him the horse's rear end. Saddam Hussein. Interesting bit of trivia. Anyway, we'll take a break here in a second. But Saddam, in order to fulfill the image that he is Nebuchadnezzar, he has spent a fortune rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. Babylon was destroyed about 600 B.C. by the Medes and the Persians, 586 or whenever it was. The Medes and the Persians came in there, destroyed Babylon, okay, wiped it out, burned the city, etc., etc. Um took Daniel captive. And the book of Daniel is interesting because Daniel starts off in Israel. He's taken a slave, made a eunuch, takes him over to uh, Babylon. He lives there for a while. Then they, they fall and he goes into Media Persia and becomes, you know, one of their high people there. By that time, he's, uh, you know, an old man, like 90 years old, and he still becomes one of the, the good guys. And they, that's when they throw him in the lion's den. He's like 90 years. You don't want to be thrown anywhere when you're 90. You certainly don't, don't want to be thrown into a den of lions. I should say den of lions, not lion's den. Because a lion's den can be the place where they live, but nobody's there. A den of lions means they're there, right? He wasn't thrown into the lion's den. He was thrown into the den of lions, which in the Bible is very clear to spell that out in the King James Version. So, Saddam decided to rebuild the ancient city. It was destroyed about 600 B.C. They've always known where it was. It was just a ruins. You know, the Middle East is full of those ruins, you know. Egypt, about all they can do is point to their glorious past and look at these big, huge buildings we used to have around here. Everything's destroyed now. But it sat desolate, destroyed for quite a while. Saddam decided to rebuild the old city. Well, most of the city walls had been preserved. It's a real sandy, you know, desert area. The wind blew all the sand in and covered them up and preserved them. They're just buried in sand. So they excavated down, found the old walls of the city, that were really well preserved, the brick was, and it contained hundreds of pictures of dragons on the sides of the city walls. Now look at this dragon. This one, they took the bricks apart and reassembled it back in Berlin. But uh, however you pronounce the name of that museum. Strange animal. It has scales all over its body. See the scales on its neck and on its tail? On the feet, it has like claws. <clears throat> now, and a, a forked tongue. That would indicate a reptile and a horn on his head. All over these walls, and they've rebuilt the walls. In other words, they've rebuilt a whole section in, in a, a museum in Berlin. They have these pictures of dragons and lions. Apparently, in 600 B.C., they really did have a dragon in captivity in Babylon. And the Catholic Bible chapter about this may be you know, based on historical fact that there were dragons still alive in 600 B.C., now, this had been 1,800 years since the flood, so probably the majority were dead, and it was a rare thing to have a dragon. Certainly be a rare thing to have a dragon in your castle. And, of course, Nebuchadnezzar and his, all of his superstition thought this was some kind of god because it obviously was a big, ferocious beast, and everybody should worship it. Of course, he built a big gold statue and said everybody should worship that, you know, and he had a hard time worshiping stuff that he shouldn't have worshipped. So here we have an interesting story about dragons from 600 B.C., uh, dinosaurs, I think, lived after the flood, becoming more rare, becoming smaller, less numerous, uh, more rare, driven out of certain areas totally. Extinct. Some species probably went extinct. By 300 B.C., they were very rare. Alexander the Great, though, reported dragons when he conquered part of India. We'll take a little break. When we come back, we'll uh, talk more about dragons that are mentioned through history and then eventually lead up into dinosaurs that are still alive today and dinosaurs that are mentioned in the Bible. We'll cover all that after the break. Okay, let's go through a few more uh, reports from ancient history, 2,000 years ago or so, about dragons. Alexander the Great um, <clears throat> conquered part of India 
as he was conquering the parts of these, these cities over there in this region, the people begged him not to kill the dragons that were sacred to them. And he said, what, what dragons? He said, oh, outside the city in the caves, there are dragons, and we take sacrifices out to them. Alexander reported that, uh, you know, he said, I told him I wouldn't kill them, but I would like to see them. When he went out to see the dragons, the dragons stuck their heads out and hissed at his soldiers and scared them half to death. That's in, I don't know if it's in his diary or what, the records of Alexander the Great. Uh, this Roman mosaic, made out of small pieces of tile, you know, stuck together, was made about the second century after Christ. It shows two long-necked dragons fighting. Or necking. Can't tell what's happening for sure. Man, that would be necking, wouldn't it? Oh, anyway, how on, earth, how on earth would the Romans know about dragons in the second century after Christ? Now, here you got these modern scholars saying, you know, nobody's ever seen a dinosaur because they lived millions of years ago. Well, how did they depict them on their pottery then? Uh, St. George is famous for slaying a dragon in 275 A.D. He was later martyred for his faith. He's the patron saint of England and Portugal. Uh, St. George and the dragon. This would have been in the first couple centuries after Christ. If you ever tried to read the old Beowulf story, I've got the story in, in uh, my library there. Old English Beowulf is extremely difficult to read. I mean, you can only understand a few of the words, okay? Because English has changed so much since 583 A.D. But the Beowulf story is interesting. I've read it several times. He killed Grendel the dragon by pulling off his arm. The story says Beowulf grabbed Grendel the dragon and pulled off one of his arms, and the creature fled out of the room and then later bled to death. Well, most anybody that studies a T-Rex will tell you, even though he had ferocious head and ferocious teeth and was, you know, huge, his front arms are pretty tiny. And if you could ever get a hold of one, you probably could jerk it right off. Hmm. They found an ancient Babylonian cylinder seal. This is from the book by Bill Cooper, After the Flood, a tremendous book. He traces the history of what happened to Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Where did their kids go? You know? And has found some amazing records, done great research. Now, Bill Cooper is a very sick man. He lives in England, but he's, uh, I believe, dying of cancer. Last report I got. But this picture is from his book about a Babylonian cylinder seal. It would have been about 600 B.C. Again, it shows a man pulling the arm off of a dragon. What a way to fight a dragon. Grab his arms. Uh, pictures from all over the world, ancient legends, ancient pottery, shows dinosaurs on it. Here's from the book, The Ancient Near East in Pictures, uh, shows a picture of two long neck animals. I would say a dinosaur. They're trying to depict here without much question. This, uh, another piece of ancient pottery, shows two long neck dragons and they're holding a sheep. Now, if dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, like the textbook says, how did these people know to depict them on their pottery? Here's a hippo tusk made of ivory uh, that was carved to be a magic wand or whatever for an Egyptian grave, found from a 12th century B.C. tomb. 1,200 years before Christ, it's even before King Solomon, um, chose an animal with a long neck and a long tail. Now, a giraffe has a long neck does not have a long tail. The only animal I know that has a long neck and a long tail is a dinosaur. There are stories and legends from countries all over the world. I, I, every place I travel, I see stuff like this. So I grab my camera and get a picture, you know. Uh, Thai seafood restaurant showing the head of a dragon on their boat. Now, why would they build boats with dragon heads on them? There's a Russian medallion showing a man slaying a dragon. A Bulgarian postage stamp has a guy slaying a dragon. Irish writer in 900 A.D. reported that somebody killed a dragon with iron nails on its tail. Probably the Stegosaurus, of course, though several dinosaurs had these big spikes on their tail. There are several websites about dragons. I don't, none of them that I'm aware of. I haven't, didn't read through all of them, but they're all uh, secular. They're not at all Christian that I could see. But they do keep um, interesting articles about dragon stories from ancient literature. So if you want to get into the study of dragons, it's really pretty interesting to see all about the dragons. The Viking ships had these dragon heads on them. 
If you study Scandinavian literature, you can see the dragon head on this one. Ancient Scandinavian literature has an awful lot of stories about the kraken or the giant dragons of the sea. We well, figure that the Vikings are the guys that are going around the ocean in their boats, you know, conquering villages. Where's the hardest place to exterminate an animal totally? In the water, in the water. yeah. Especially the ocean. <laughs> on land, you could eventually corner it, figure out some way to get it, but on the ocean, you'd have a tough time. And so there are th this is from 1000 A.D. Here we have evidence of dragons living with man just 1,000 years ago. In the book called The Unexplained, um, there's information about this. There's also uh, an account of a dragon called Nithhogger that the Vikings was killed in the book After the Flood by uh, William Cooper, Bill Cooper. According to the Norse legend, Siegfried slew the dragon Fafner that was... The dragon had made its home in a cave, and somebody else had buried a treasure in that cave. I'm sure the dragon didn't know that and didn't care, but the people wanted the treasure, of course, so you got to kill the dragon to get to it. Several, there are several different stories about how Siegfried, Siegfried slew the dragon. Uh, of course, you know, legends get twisted with time. One story says he dug a pit because they knew the only soft part of, of the dragon was his belly. So he dug a pit and laid in this pit until the dragon went over him, and then he jabbed his sword up into the dragon's belly. That's one story. Another one is he just charged up there and just stabbed it in the heart, you know. Who knows how it really happened. But Carl Schuker is a scientist in England, has a great book called Dragons, A Natural History. I've got it in my library. Just story after story of people slaying dragons down through history. Marco Polo reported in his memoirs, when he came back from China, he said, the emperor in China raises dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Ceremonial dragons. Well, all you have to do is go to any Chinese restaurant, and you'll see dragons all over the place. It's just a part of their culture. Over in China, you probably saw them all over, didn't you? Well, they, they have a different connotation than they do in the West. You see, they represent the king. They're, they're very positive. In the West, they're bad. In China, the dragon represents the king, and it's very good. Interesting. Well, why on earth would Marco Polo come back and say, the emperor is raising dragons? to pull, pull chariots in his parades. I think it's probably because the emperor was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. <laughs> Marco Polo was an extremely famous man. Well, he wouldn't want to do something dumb and jeopardize his reputation, I don't think, anyway. Uh, a city in France was renamed Nurluk in honor of the man who slew the dragon in the city. I think if we actually could get an uh, unperverted view of history, we would see there's an awful lot of legends that are based on some kind of real story. If you go to the Grand Canyon, you will find carvings on the walls of the Grand Canyon. The Indians did this all over. They call them pictograph, including a picture of a dinosaur. If you look at dinosaurs, many of them had the upright posture, we call that. They walk on two legs, and the front two legs, we assume, were you know held up off the ground, similar to an ostrich, I guess, uh, upright posture. Though there are some animals like frogs that walk on four legs. The front two are real tiny, the back two are really big. So the size of the leg doesn't mean he didn't walk on it, necessarily. But why would they carve dragons on the walls of the Grand Canyon? Here's another one with a round body, four legs, long neck, long tail. Dr. Delancey was a dentist in Pennsylvania um, who took these pictures. His wife, Margaret Delancey, um, his widow, she uh, lives in Percocy, Pennsylvania. Right? I've preached up in that city four or five times, right near there, Sellersville, and up just north of Philadelphia. That's south. Of, you're from Allentown, though, right? Up That's south of Scranton. Yeah. Um, he's the one who took these pictures, and she let me use these. Uh, in the Aboriginal caves in Australia, there are many legends of dragons from caves in Australia. This was just sent to me. Agawa Rock Art from, however you pronounce that, uh, Lake Superior Provincial Park, Ontario, Canada. Notice the outline of the dragon with the bumps on his back. This is called cliff art, rock art. There's another name for this. Uh, some people call it oop art. That'd be a good quiz question. O-O-P means out of place. Out of place artifacts. And so they get the name oop art. Um, that's just a slogan that people use. So if you find something that shouldn't be there, if you're digging down in the ground and you're down in 
area where it should be from, you know, 500 years ago from some Indian civilization, and you find an Evinrude outboard motor, that would be an out-of-place artifact, right? That shouldn't be there. So upart is out-of-place artifacts, things that really shouldn't be there. This type of stuff is by the evolutionist, a person who believes in evolution, often will classify this kind of material as, well, we don't understand it, it's an enigma, you know, forget it. I've got whole books of these enigmas that they can't explain. Down in Lima, Peru, if you go south about eight hours drive through the mountains, you come to the city of Ica. Ica, Peru is right near the desert that is the driest desert in the world. My understanding is it's only rained once there in 400 years. Not a good place for a uh, uh, garden. But the Spanish came through this area about 400 years ago in the late 1500s. They came through and they saw these strange white lines. Not very wide, but there were these white lines. Just somebody scratched like a plow on a field. Perfectly straight lines, you know, for a long ways. Nobody knew what they were until airplanes were invented. When you get way up in the sky, you notice these are pictures of giant images. You ever heard of those before, the Nazca Desert lines, you know? Um, they have you know, spiders and hummingbirds, and I mean, four or five miles long. Sometimes they go right, you come to a mountain, it stops, you go on the other side of the mountain, and it takes off in an exact straight line. So these guys really knew something about surveying and mathematics to be able to do this. Or, there's another reasonable theory, I think, they had flight. They knew how to fly. 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Here's people after the flood living to be 400 years. You could learn a lot in 400 years. People before the flood are 900 years old. You could really learn a lot in 900 years. Plus, you can go talk to your great, 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 great grandfather because he's still alive. You can get all this. The wisdom would be incredible, the knowledge that was preserved. In the uh, Smithsonian, they have, and I'll show you when I get to video number uh, seven, our question answer, we've got a whole section on was ancient man primitive. We have a book, as a matter of fact, on that topic here that we sell. Or here, we do sell the uh, book After the Flood by Bill Cooper. I didn't, I didn't forgot about that. We just started carrying that. The Puzzle of Ancient Man is a great book, which shows, for instance, uh, Pictures of things that are found in graves that just shouldn't be there. Like a grave in uh, South America, they found an airplane. This grave was at least a thousand years old. Airplane. An airplane, a little toy airplane. So Smithsonian has it, and they have it labeled as a stylized insect. Tell me that's a stylized insect. In 1571, the Spanish reported finding stones with strange animals carved on them. Now, who remembers roughly when were dinosaurs uh, rediscovered in modern times? The first one was reassembled, the bones put together when? 1809. 1571. By 1571, most dinosaurs were extinct, been killed off by man. They had not been rediscovered yet to put them together in museums. So we have a several hundred year time lag in here where nobody knew about dinosaurs. Never heard of them. Never saw one. But the Spanish said these stones had strange animals carved on them. They didn't know what they were. They just reported it. You know, we went across this desert and found strange carvings. Today they are known as the Nazca burial stones from the Nazca Desert. They were probably built about the time of Christ, roughly 500 B.C. to 500 A.D. These stones are a little smaller than a football, though they range from, you know, golf ball size to the size of a lazy boy chair. The average is about the size of a football or less. Here's Dr. Dakara, a medical doctor from Lima, Peru, who collects the stones. He has 11,000 of them in his collection. These stones have dinosaurs on them. Now, it's interesting, if you really study this topic, and I've re I read Dr. Dakara's book, and I've t I know several folks who've been down there many times to study this. I could get one of the stones for 2,000 bucks if I want to spend 2,000 on one, get one of these little Ica stones. I've held them in my hand. Um, it's just an amazing story about these, these stones. This one, for instance, uh, over 50,000 have been found in Ica. This one shows a Triceratops. Behind him is a Stegosaurus. In front of him is an Ankylosaurus, probably. Off to the left is a, an Apatosaurus, long neck, and a T-Rex of some kind. Notice on the sides of this, this one, you see the circles in the skin? 
Hmm. Keep that thought in mind. Here's a guy hitting one on the head with something. Dr. Baugh is a friend of mine from Glen Rose, Texas. He has two of the stones. If you're driving across and stop at the museum, you can see his Ica stones that he has there. He went down there and was able, because he's a museum, they do a museum to museum transfer. You're not allowed to sell Peruvian treasures or you'll be, uh, you go to jail. Now, because of this, the people who are finding these stones have to be very careful what they do. Don Patton lives in Garland, Texas. He has one of the stones. You can see some good pictures on them on the website, Bible.ca, which stands for Canada, uh, slash tracks. Is the, now, I don't agree with some of the stuff on Bible.ca. They, they do have a lot of interesting material on there, uh, on this website. Um, Anton Ouellette is a friend of mine from Canada. He speaks French He went and Spanish and English. He went down there and spent eight months studying the Ica stones. He gave me the book about the Ica stones that I have and uh, pictures, the pictures that he took of these Ica stones. There's his phone number if you want to call him up, 450-359-4405. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Dennis Swift is a pastor in Oregon. I preached at his church at a large Nazarene church there in Beaverton, Oregon. That's about 2,500 people. He um, collects the stones also. He goes down there twice a year to study this topic and brings back the stones if he can. Here's, again, notice the circles on the side of the dinosaur. Kind of strange. Here's Dennis Swift holding one with the triceratops on it. The carvings in these stones are pretty amazing. They all, they all have a coating on them that comes with time. It's called oxidation. Almost all materials, or many materials, if they're exposed to the air, they oxidize. You know, your car starts off bright, shiny paint. After 10 years, if you don't do anything, it'll oxidize and the paint fades. The oxygen actually, you know, gets into the paint and oxidizes it. Well, that's what happens to these stones also. So they analyzed these stones and said that the coating on there, the oxidized coating, would require several hundred years to accumulate that much. So if somebody comes along and says, well, these stones are fake, somebody made them last week. We have several things to prove that that is not true. Number one, the oxidized coating on there says they're at least several hundred years old. Number two, the Spanish reported them 400 years ago, before dinosaurs were even a, a, a popular idea. Number three, this circle on the side is interesting. Now, dinosaur bones have been found for the last few hundred years and reassembled. Nobody had ever found dinosaur skin. Dinosaur skin would not fossilize very easily. A few times, skin impressions were found where apparently the dinosaur fell down in the mud. He rotted away, but the mud hardened. And it left behind an impression of his skin, and you can see they did have scales. In 1992, I believe, a Bolivian missionary found fossilized dinosaur skin. This is from Dr. Baugh's museum. Again, on the dinosaur on the left, you can notice the circles on the side. They've discovered now that dinosaur skin has rosetta patterns, they're called, circles. Now, if the skin wasn't discovered until 1992, but the stones were discovered in 1940s, basically. The Spanish knew about them, but in 1946, they really became popular. People started going after these things. How would they know to put the circles on the side if you're carving them? You would not know to put those circles on the side of the dinosaur because you didn't know dinosaurs had circles in their skin because no skin had ever been found until 1992. Interesting. Now, because it is illegal to sell Peruvian treasure, they sent, because, and because of this, all the information about these stones, somebody, I think it was NOVA or some science program, sent somebody down there to Peru to investigate. They got down there and they got this one of the farmers who has produced most of the stones and he won't tell anybody where he gets them because he's out, he's out robbing these graves. That's what he's doing, these old graves. Um, and he sells these stones to tourists or to Dr. Dakara, who buys as many as he can afford. Um, they got this guy on camera and asked him, where do you get these stones? Now understand, if you are getting Peruvian treasures, you know, ancient artifacts and selling them, you go to jail. They say in Peru, a jail sentence is like a death sentence. Because they're just, I mean, you think Mexican jails are bad. They say Peruvian jails are the worst there are. 
For one thing, they, they throw you in jail and lock you up. They don't feed you. They don't entertain you. They do nothing for you. If your family on the outside doesn't bring you some food, you will starve to death. Average life expectancy in a Peruvian jail is about two years, is what I've been told. So, here's the camera videotaping this Mexican farmer, or this Peruvian farmer, and they're asking him the question, where do you get these stones? Right behind the camera are two Peruvian police officers. In case he says, I'm digging them up out of a grave and I'm selling them. He's going to go to jail. So the guy stands there in front of the camera and says, oh, I make these stones. It's a hobby of mine. So they say, gave him one of the stones that had no markings on it, gave him the same kind of rock, and said, here, make one for us. So he carved one out with a, with a you know, scratched the, the surface like that, and it was lousy. Nothing similar at all to what he had here. But the scientist came home and said, see, they're, they're saying there's dinosaurs lived with humans. You know, we know it's not true. Just Peruvian farmers making these things. It's all a big hoax. And that story is still reported today among the evolutionist circles because they got this one report where somebody went down there and investigated it. Well, it was just simply silly the way that was done. They have the oxidized coating. They had circles in the skin. They can't make them like this. Nobody's been able to now anyway. The simple fact is they're trying to cover up for the obvious. They don't want to admit that maybe man and dinosaurs live together. Um, Dennis Swift here is holding one again. You see the circles on the side of the uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, probably. Here's a guy cutting the head off of one. Uh, obviously, I would think a dinosaur-like creature. Here's a guy riding one. Some have suggested that maybe dinosaurs were used to help build some of the giant buildings, like the Great Pyramid, or the huge stones found up in Peru in the mountains that weigh 20,000 tons. Well, the biggest crane on Earth today can only lift 3,000 tons. There's a picture in there of a 100,000, I mean, of a 100-ton rock in that book, uh, The Ancient Puzzle of Ancient Man. These are up on the top of mountains. And they're cut, and they fit together with, you know, part of a wall. How do you move a 100-ton stone? Well, some have suggested maybe dinosaurs were involved. In a city called Acumbaro, Mexico, if you look at Mexico City on a map and go west about an hour, you come to the city of Acumbaro. Um, John Turney, I've talked to him on the phone, never met him yet, he's in Connecticut. He's been there many times to study the similar stones that are found in Acumbaro, Mexico. Down there, this stones with dinosaurs and humans on them, it's kind of a cult. They're, they're guarded. It's kind of a secret. They don't want people knowing about this. But at least 56,000 of these stones have been found, and they're locked away in a big museum. John Turney's been in to see them and photographed them. Uh, again, you find dinosaurs and humans together in Acumbaro, Mexico. Now, first place, who on earth would sit around and carve 56,000 stones? Why? If you're just going to lock them up in a museum, what's your motive? Um, I think we have evidence, very strong evidence, of man and dinosaurs living together. In 1572, an Italian peasant killed a dragon. The story goes that he was walking his cows. The small dragon came out and hissed at his cows and scared them. So he smacked it on the head and broke its neck, killed the dragon. They got the local guy in town who was interested in scientific type stuff, a local scientist named Ulysses Aldrovandus, an Italian scientist who got the dead body of this dragon and had it stuffed and mounted for a museum display. It wasn't the bones, it was the skin, stuffed by a taxidermist in 1572. Roman artifacts were found in Tucson, Arizona, in an old grave. Now, you got to understand, the Roman Empire was, you know, around the time of Christ. Kind of petered out about 300 years after Christ. And the political Roman Empire switched hats and became the holy, uh, Catholic, unholy Roman Catholic Church. And so it's really continuing the same era, the same legacy. Catholic Church is a continuation of the Roman Empire. But Roman swords were found in Tucson, Arizona. Well, of course, there's lots of evidence from many sources that ever since the flood, people have been trading back and forth across the oceans. Uh, Jewish or Hebrew coins from about the time of Christ have been found in Ohio, 
buried in old mounds. The Hebrews came over here. The Romans came over to America. You know, here we are teaching our kids that Columbus was the first white man to come over here 500 years ago. I'm sorry, that's just not true. Roman artifacts are found in Tucson, Arizona. One of these artifacts, one of these swords, has a dinosaur on it. So I called the guy who has the sword. His name is Tom Peterson, Arizona Historical Society. I said, Tom, the dinosaurs did not live at the same time. Now, wait a minute. Does he know they did not live at the same time, or does he believe they did not live at the same time? See, his, his preconceived idea that evolution is true prevents him from accepting this as, as evidence. All he knows is, this can't be legitimate because evolution is true. But if you're willing to quit, get rid of all your prejudices, like a scientist is supposed to do, and say, hey, hey uh, maybe man and dinosaurs lived at the same time. During the age of sailing ships, there are thousands of stories of people sighting sea monsters. Well, you got to understand, from about the time of Columbus, you know, first guy really to go across the ocean in modern times, there was a thousand-year span of history where things were very suppressed. Knowledge was suppressed, you know. The Catholic Church really put the, you know, put the clamps down, and they wanted everybody in, in darkness. Um, and so Columbus sailed across the ocean. Now, many people have done it before, but there was a, the Dark Ages is a very legitimate uh, age in history. They're, they're going with a boat, with a sailboat. Sailboats don't make much noise going through the water. Early 1900s, you start developing steam engines, diesel engines, gasoline engines, internal combustion engines. They make a lot of noise. Now, sound travels real fast underwater. You can go under underwater at one end of a lake, have somebody go a long ways away and bang two rocks together underwater, and you'll hear it. Where well, you couldn't hear it above water, right? Put your head under in the bathtub sometime and just tap on the side of the tub. A light tap that you would never hear in the air, you will hear through the water. So since sound travels much faster and much longer, much farther through water, whales, for instance, can yell at each other or, you know, call to each other a hundred miles away. A whale can, in their songs, they say they can hear them 100 miles away underwater. Okay, during the age of sailing ships, it's pretty quiet going through the water, so my contention is maybe that's why there are so many legends of sea serpents, sea monsters. You would be able to get closer to them because your boat's not making so much noise. Whereas today with your diesel engine, they can hear you coming 100 miles away, and they've learned to avoid the shipping lanes. There are lots of stories of people sighting sea monsters. Missionary Hans Egged reported a sea monster. His great-great-great-great-great-great-grandson, um, S.M. McAllister, came to a meeting when I spoke up in New England someplace, Delaware, I believe. He said, oh yeah, my great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather uh, was Hans Egged. And in his diary, I've got the whole photocopy of the diary in one of my files there, he reported seeing a sea monster that stuck its head up even with one of the top uh, sails on the ship. And it had two little flappers, he called it, flappers. We probably would call it a flipper. And they said it had like a mane running down its back. Of course, it may have been when it came out of the water, the water is still dripping off of its fin, which would make it look like a horse's mane, if the water is still dripping off. Um, Bishop uh, Eric Pontopadon of Norway in 1755 reported that he saw a sea monster. I believe that was off the coast of Greenland, if I, if I remember. Um, this you know, Hans Egged was off the coast of Greenland. Bishop uh, to Norway, I forget where he saw it, but I've, you can get the book, Monsters of the Sea. I've got most of these books in my library. Captain McKay tells a fascinating story. about He was the captain of the HMS Daedalus. In 1848, on August of 1848, they were sailing around, and a sea monster swam under their boat. The lookout called for the captain and said, Captain, we got a sea monster out here. So the captain came up on deck, called some more of the crew up there. They watched this sea monster for 20 minutes. He said, it came so close to my boat, if I would have known it, if it would have been, he said, if it would have been a man of mine acquaintance, I could have easily recognized him. He was close enough for me to recognize this creature. He said it was on a steady course, didn't deviate. He said it was going against the wind. And if you read the account that McKay left behind, 
it just it rules out all other possibilities that people have tried to use to explain this. Some people say, well, it was just a piece of driftwood. They don't go against the wind. It was going against the wind and against the current. These sailboat captains, you know, take careful records on all that kind of stuff, which way is the current, which way is the wind. I mean, that's, they're very dependent on those things. The sailors on board begged the captain not to mention this in the logbook. They said, Captain, please don't mention this in the logbook. Why would they do that? Yeah, you're gonna, they're going to get laughed at. You go back from a long fishing trip and say, hey, we saw a sea monster. Average landlubber, you know, who doesn't ever go out, he looks at the ocean once in a while. How far out? You can see out five, six miles. The ocean's huge, you know. You look like the idiot Russian astronauts who went up, circled the moon, came back and said, well, we didn't see God, so he must not exist. <laughs> I think about it. You didn't see him, so he doesn't exist. You go out and look at the beach. I don't see any dinosaurs, therefore they don't exist. You know, that's the attitude some people have. For one thing, right now, how much of the ocean would you guess is being observed by people right now? Not much. Ships, even today, ships generally stick to the shipping lanes because they take advantage of the currents. I mean, if you're in a giant boat, you know, carrying a zillion pounds of material, <clears throat> and you're only getting, you're only going, you know, 11 miles an hour, and you can get in a current that will carry you an extra three miles an hour. That cuts four days off your time going across the ocean. Meanwhile, you're paying all this crew four days pay. Well, it just makes common sense, you know. Figure out where the currents are and follow the currents. Which means there are large sections of the ocean that are never sailed over. There's no currents there to take advantage of. Um, in 1850s, there was a whaling ship called the Monongahela. Now, there's a fascinating story. You can get at UWF Library about the Monongahela. It's in uh, QL89, if you go to the UWF Library. QL89 is the section of the library that has books about Loch Ness Monster and stuff like that. Captain on the board the Monongahela set sail to catch whales. It's a whaling ship. I've read the whole story. I just have a brief synopsis of it here. But the story goes, basically, the lookout hollered down, Captain, there's a sea monster out there. The sea monster was sleeping on some floating uh, seaweed, or kelp, I think it was. The captain called the crew up on deck. They saw the sea monster. Now, this is a whaling ship. These are the guys that get in those little boats and go out there with those big harpoons and stick it inside of a whale. You would have to be pretty brave to do something like that. He said, sailors, um, we have for years heard stories of sea monsters. How many of you have heard stories of sea monsters? And, of course, they all raised their hand. He said, how many of you have laughed at somebody else for claiming they saw a sea monster? Raised their hand. He said, fellas, there's a sea monster. We have two choices. Go back to port, report we saw a sea monster, and get laughed at the rest of our life. Or go kill it and prove they exist. Any volunteers to go kill the sea monster? He got enough volunteers to man, I think, three boats, whaling boats. So these guys get their harpoons, they get in these boats, they go out there after the sea monster, which is sleeping, sunbathing or something, on the kelp. They get up beside it and they harpoon it. I think the story says they stuck five harpoons in it. Sea monster, of course, woke up right away, jerked his head around, and they said that the jaw on this creature was about eight feet long. When it came around, it hit the captain, who was standing up in his boat, knocked him out of the boat. The serpent was just twitching around, seeing what stuck me in the side. You know, why do I have a pain here all of a sudden? So he twitches around, knocks the captain unconscious. A couple of sailors jump in, grab the captain, drag him out, put him in the boat, you know, revive him. Meanwhile, this sea serpent slides off the kelp and heads for the bottom. And they have the ropes, and they're pouring water on as this rope is whizzing out over the front of the boat. they got this little thing, the gunwale, I think they call it, where the, the rope goes out. No, the gunwale's the back. But the, the rope goes whizzing out through this little V-shaped thing to keep it in place. And the sea serpent is going to the bottom. They realize they're going to run out of rope, so they tie another rope on. If I remember the story, it's been seven years since I read it, but they, the sea monster went down about 1,500 feet. 
one or two of the harpoons pulled loose. The other one stuck. Here's this sea monster way down underwater with these ropes hooked to harpoons that are still stuck in him. Of course, what a harpoon is supposed to do, it's supposed to, you know, make it bleed to death. That's why they kill the whales. Um, after a long time, I forget, I think it was several hours, but it was quite a while, one of the sailors hollered, he's coming up. The rope is going slack. So they start pulling in the rope, and about an eighth of a mile away from them, the sea monster surfaces, and it's thrashing around as it's dying. They said it apparently had stayed down too long because it, it coughed up its own lungs. Its lungs exploded, and the lungs were hanging out of its mouth. Um, they waited till it thrashed around and died. They dragged it over to the boat and cut it up. They measured it 103 feet long. I believe the number was 103 feet 6 inches. I mean, they really measured it. The sailor said it had two blowholes, like a whale does. You have two nostrils. A whale has two blowholes on the back of its head. It had four swim fins, an alligator-like head, and 94 very sharp teeth. A passing ship stopped as the crew was cutting it up, and they bought some barrels of sea serpent oil. Now, the story goes that they, they, this thing had a layer of blubber like a whale does. Whale blubber ranges, you know, say, two feet thick. They would cut off this whale blubber, the fat, on the outside of a whale, and boil it down to make whale, uh, whale oil. That's what they used to use. I've heard they still use it to make transmission fluid out of whale oil. But they used to use it in old days for lamps and you know stuff like that. Whale oil was very expensive. A boat could go out. It was very risky business, but if you caught enough whales to fill your uh, boat with uh, whale oil, you could retire after one cruise. But a lot of people went out and died, you know, so it was a risky business. Anyway, whale oil has sort of a red color to it when they boil it down. This sea serpent oil had a layer of blubber, so they boiled it down and it was clear, like water. But it burned just like whale oil. You could use it for lamps, but it was clear oil. Pretty interesting. Um, the other boat that saw these guys, they said, what are you guys doing? They said, we killed a sea monster. Come on over, take a look. So they went over and helped him cut it up and said, we'd like to buy the oil off of you, and we're going to go back home and tell people we saw a sea monster. We held it in our hands. Here's the oil to prove it. So sure enough, they sail back home with their sea serpent oil and sell it or whatever and tell their stories. Ha, you guys just wait till the Monongahela gets here. Because they, they, the Monongahela said, well, this is great, but we didn't come out you know, for sea monster. Our boss didn't pay us for this. We're supposed to come back with whale oil. We've got to go get a few more whales. <clears throat> so they sailed off in search of whales and it was never heard from again. Many years later, a board washed up on a beach on one of the Aleutian Islands down by Alaska. You know, they got the little islands coming off of Alaska. The board was, what, was the, the name board Monongahela. So that's all we know. It's logical to assume that the ship sank in a storm. Now, on board the Monongahela was the bones to the sea serpent. They kept the bones to prove it. But it's in Davy Jones' locker right now. Arthur Henry Rawston was an officer on the Campania, the chief officer. He later was one of the officers on the Titanic and drowned on the Titanic when it went, went down in 1912. But in 1907, he was sailing off the coast of Ireland near the town of Cork. I've been there to preach. He said he saw a long-necked object which he sketched as it moved. It was turning its head from side to side. He drew sketches of it as it moved across. Now notice, Ireland has a spot right here where the ocean comes in and the deep part comes in closer to land. Pensacola has one of those too. They got the, they got the continental shelf where it's not very deep, but there's a little ridge comes up off between Pensacola and Panama City. The Gulf of Mexico has a deep spot that comes in, underwater canyon. You don't notice it when you're going over the top, but I'll show you a map later about that. Anyway, this is where he sighted, sighted this thing off the coast of Cork, Ireland. He said he saw a sea serpent. Now, here's the captain of the ship, the chief officer of the ship, okay? Not the captain. This book is called Titanic, Triumph and Tragedy. I want you to notice what the next sentence says. However imaginative the young officer may have been. <laughs> Wait a minute. Do you see any prejudice in that statement? 
In other words, you know, we know he was just imagining this. It can't be true. I would say the author of the book T Titanic Triumph and Tragedy has a prejudice. He believes in evolution. He believes dinosaurs did not live with man. And therefore, whatever the captain saw, it, it can't be a sea monster. It can't be a dinosaur. He said, however imaginative this officer may have been, it did not interfere with his progress in the company's service. It's almost like implying, you know, it really should have. He should have got fired for claiming there was a sea monster because we know they don't exist. He was, um, he has a prejudice. During World War I, 1915, a German U-boat commander, and this story is told in the book uh, Dinosaurs by Design by Dwayne Gish, which is here in our repertoire somewhere. Um, he said this German submarine sank a British ship. It exploded and sank quickly. 25 seconds later, there was an explosion. Back in those days, the steam engines on board, if they, when you submerge them in water, the steam engine will explode from cooling too quickly. So probably it sank, the water got to the steam engine and it exploded, or to the engine room, 25 seconds later. He said, pieces of wreckage and among them a gigantic sea animal was shot up out of the water. It was about 60 feet long. He described the sea serpent as having four flippers and an alligator-like head and being about 60 feet long. The captain said, I didn't have a camera at the time, and it sank in a few seconds. He said, I didn't have time to go down and get my camera, or I'd have taken a picture of it, of this thing thrashing around as it was dying. One theory is, hey, when a ship sinks, it's a lot of free meat. Sea monsters come to get the sailors. There are stories of octopus pulling ships underwater. In uh, 1989, on Christmas Eve, a sea accident occurred in the southern Philippines off Mantico. Fishermen recovered 12 survivors hanging onto the overturned motorized canoe, as well as the body of a 12-year-old boy, a 12-week-old boy. Survivors claimed that a giant octopus had attacked the vessel, grabbing its pontoons. Uh, one of the people said, the, suddenly the waters began to bubble. Then we saw something that looked like a giant octopus. It was as huge as an imported cow. After the attack, the beast submerged rather than injure any survivors. Interesting. 11 years ago. No, you don't hear about this stuff on the news. Um, there was an octopus that washed up on the beach in St. Augustine, Florida, 100 years ago. There's Dr. Webb standing next to the remains of it. He got cables and horses and, and a bunch of horses and tried to drag this thing up away from the beach because it washed up on the beach once and then another tide took it back out and three months later it was reported again, still floating around. I think it was three months. It was a long time. But uh, this octopus laying on the beach, had his, the legs had all rotted away, just the stump of the head of the octopus. It was 200 feet across. They estimate it would have been with its legs on. Weighed five tons. That's a big octopus. See, octopus never stop growing. Neither do reptiles, okay? Neither do squids. A whale was killed near Seattle, Washington. Inside the whale's stomach was one arm to an octopus that was 150 feet long. All around the side of the whale were scars that were nine inch diameter. See, octopus have those suckers under their arms. They grab onto something and dig into it. Those little, those little suckers actually have little teeth in some of them. They will suck and dig in and tear out a chunk of flesh. Nine inch diameter scars. Well, there's two theories. One is the whale got attacked when it was a baby. Little normal scars. And as the whale grew, the scars grew. Okay, could be. Or it was attacked when it was older and the, something had nine inch diameter suckers on its arm, which would make it a huge octopus. All they know is they found inside the stomach a 150-foot arm. Now, whales love to eat octopus or squid, either one. If a whale eats too much octopus or squid, he'll get sick and puke it back up. And after an octopus has been digested a while and it gets into the whale's intestines, it forms a special substance called ambergris. And if a whale gets sick and pukes up the ambergris, it'll float around in the ocean like a blob of fat. You better grab it because it's worth a fortune. That's what they used to make perfume out of. Whale puke. That explains a few things, doesn't it, fellas? Yeah. Look it up in the dictionary. Ambergris. Okay, that'll be a good quiz question. What is the substance 
uh, made from uh, certain whales that is used to make perfume. It would be ambergris. Here's a picture uh, of a whale attacking a giant squid. There are many reports of this happening. The U.S. Uh, Navy oceanographic research vessel in 1966 was off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada, up north of Maine. San Pablo, they observed an encounter between a giant squid and a sperm whale. It's from Peabody Museum at Yale University. The picture's on the wall there. Here I am at Peabody Museum. Over my head is a model of a giant squid. Now, squids and octopus never stop growing. This baby squid washed up on the beach in New Zealand five years ago. They said it was an immature female squid, and full-grown it would have probably been 150 feet long. A giant squid was captured in uh, Newfoundland in 1878 that was 80 feet long. Now, if you look at a map underwater of Newfoundland, the way the ocean floor has got real deep parts, and it comes up kind of close to the shore, as opposed to a big continental shelf. You know, it just goes out and drops off to the deep. Who knows why? The way the currents are right there, the Gulf Stream and the way the wind patterns are, nobody knows for sure, but there seems to be times when giant squid decide to come up and die and get washed up on shore. So, dinosaurs, I think, have lived with man all through history. A giant animal still alive today, some of them. Are they in the Bible? What time is it? Oh, man, we've got to quit. We'll cover dinosaurs in the Bible next class. Thank you so much.